You've seen it before. After successfully hiding his secret identity from Lois once again, Superman winks at the audience from inside the television set. Dora the Explorer anxiously implores her young viewers to shout Swiper No Swiping to help her stop her nemesis. In one of his comics, Deadpool, unbothered, informs the evil scientist who's in the middle of torturing him that none of this is actually happening. There's a man at a typewriter. This is all his twisted imagination. This happens all the time in stories. A character in the fiction acknowledges that they are a character in a piece of fiction. It's called Breaking the Fourth Wall, and it's fun because it's just a little naughty, isn't it? You're not really supposed to break the immersion in that way, right? It's almost like, just for a moment, instead of asking the audience to immerse themselves in it, the story is reaching out to immerse itself in the audience's world. In some ways, it feels like the outer boundary of what we can even consider fiction. The fourth wall describes the ultimate line between what is real and what is not. Or, at least, it would, if there wasn't something else beyond it. Past the wreckage of every broken fourth wall, through the settling dust, if you really look, you can just make out the shape of something else. Something bigger, more imposing, spanning the distance as far as the eye can see in every direction. The shadowy, undefined, rarely broken fifth wall. One of the best things in life is learning, which is probably why you're here to begin with. Unfortunately, not everyone learns the same. Public school is not quite a one-size-fits-all option, and a lot of the artists and creative types among us end up missing out on a lot of precious education as a result. Fortunately, there is a shockingly easy, fun, and highly personalized way to get an education right from home. Learn all your fundamentals, maths, sciences, computer programming, and more with our sponsor, Brilliant. Visit brilliant.org slash tailfoundry to get 30 days for free and 20% off a year subscription. Seriously, this is the most fun you'll ever have learning this stuff. Try it out for free and be as brilliant as I know you can be. Before we can talk about breaking the fifth wall, we kind of have to figure out what it really is. And that's a bit harder than you might expect because Unlike with the fourth wall, almost nobody seems to agree on this. There are a lot of different approaches to defining the fifth wall, but there are two in particular that I seem to see a bit more than the others. Some say that it might just be the dividing line between different story worlds. I mean, it's not an unreasonable idea. Kind of a different direction than the fourth wall, but not unreasonable when you think about it. Unless stories are explicitly told to be taking place in the same universe, you usually expect them to stay within the boundaries of their own world building. It would be weird if Mufasa just showed up in Star Wars to be Luke's new surrogate dead father figure. The world might never recover if Gandalf stepped onto the bridge of the Starship Enterprise and started lighting pine cones on fire. If you take this to be the fifth wall, then the way that you break it is through crossovers or subtle references. Like, for instance, Pixar's Pizza Planet truck which appears in almost every Pixar movie ever, from Toy Story to WALL-E to A Bug's Life. But I'm not really sure if I'm convinced this is a fifth wall break. To me, this still feels like another, albeit very creative, type of fourth wall break. Without some kind of explicit rationalization, like in Marvel's multiverse, characters showing up in each other's stories is, after all, an implicit acknowledgement that they are fictional. One of the more convincing versions of the fifth wall is, in my opinion, the one that tries to be reality. If the fourth wall stands between reality and fiction, maybe the fifth wall stands between imagination and belief. Maybe breaking the fifth wall is when, instead of just sending you off with a wink, the story tries to stay with you in your world. The story The Perfect Host by Theodore Sturgeon features a parasite which can inhabit both the physical and psychological worlds. Sort of a mimetic virus. In the story, the narrator warns the reader that, 
just by reading this far, they themselves might already be infected by the very same parasite. Still sends a shiver down my spine. It's a good trick. But still, when you think about it, it is just fiction reaching into our world, breaking the fourth wall. It's creative, it's powerful, but I still wouldn't quite call this the fifth wall. I think, in order to find a useful definition for the fifth wall, we really have to pay attention to what we mean by the fourth wall and try to find something separate, relative to, but still distinct from it, rather than just looking at really creative versions of it. So, let's start at the start. There's a reason it's called the fourth wall. It comes from old school theater, where the stage is boxed in by three solid walls on each side, but then the fourth wall is missing. It's an open space, letting out onto the theater, where the audience is sitting, watching. The fourth wall is invisible. It's the unseen barrier which stands between the performers on stage and the audience, between fiction and reality. When an actor turns to address the audience, acknowledging that they're a character in a play, the illusion of that invisible boundary is in breach. The fourth wall is broken. So, if this is the fourth wall, then it kind of stands to reason that the fifth wall is the next layer out. The wall at the back of the theater, behind the audience, separating who they are from something else? There's a game you may have heard of called Doki Doki Literature Club. Not really my usual fare, kind of an anime, light novel, dating sim style experience, but there is a massive twist in this game that makes it worth playing for just about anybody. If you don't want to hear spoilers, now's the time to pause the video and go try the game out yourself, and I would definitely recommend going in blind because it is a very unique experience. You play as the newest member of a high school literature club, run by a group of cute girls who write poems with you. Innocent enough, but over the course of the game, the storyline, the graphics, and the game mechanics themselves gradually become more and more bizarre, corrupted. After a devastating series of tragedies, you eventually realize that the president of the literature club, the ever-serene, composed, unassuming Monica, is not like the others. It becomes increasingly obvious that she is self-aware. She knows she's a character in a game, and she's in love with you. Not the player character, you, the player, the person at the keyboard. In a desperate bid to win your attention and keep you all for herself, she warps the story in horrific ways, even going to the lengths of actually deleting the other girl's game files from your computer so that they no longer exist in the game. Her ultimate goal? To create a world where it can be you and her and nobody else. Not the other characters, not the rest of the game and its mechanics, just Monica. Okay, so this is another very creative fourth wall break, right? And in that way, Monica is a very scary, devious character, breaking the boundaries of the fiction to get what she wants. But if you step back and exercise some empathy, she's also very tragic. Imagine what she's going through. She's discovered how minute and simple her world is, and the person that she wants to be with more than anything is literally a world away in a higher reality she will never truly be able to reach. To her, you are the only thing that she knows that's real. You are the lifeline of this fictional character to reality. Given all that, it's not really surprising that she's gone more than a little mad. I can understand why she would reach so hard for you. Thankfully, this is just a Monica problem. It's an interesting idea to explore in a game, but not something you'll ever have to go through. Even after Monica breaks the fourth wall and ruins the illusion of the story, you can still be pretty comfortable as the player. I mean, at least you're real, right? Well, how can you ever really know that? I mean, how do we know that we, as the audience watching a fiction, aren't also living a fiction ourselves. How do we know that we aren't kind of like Monica, that there's no audience in a higher reality watching us? All the world's a stage, writes Shakespeare, and all the men and women merely players. I know this sounds a little ridiculous, a little simulation theory-ish, 
It's kind of a weird place to take things on this fun story analysis channel, but I think it's more familiar territory than you might expect. Every time you catch yourself wondering about the supernatural, every time you pray to a deity, if you do pray, every time you ponder what might lie beyond the discrete mathematical order of the cosmos, you are reaching beyond the fifth wall. If the fourth wall is the barrier between fiction and reality, then a fifth wall would imply a similar relationship, something beyond reality as we know it, that is somehow realer or truer. The entire theater, audience and all, becomes the performance on the stage. And the audience for that performance? Who knows? Maybe God? Maybe viewers in another dimension watching us as they would any piece of media? Maybe something weirder than we can really comprehend. Unsurprisingly, it's pretty hard to find good examples of this in fiction. It's kind of a tall order challenging someone's entire reality, but there are a few out there, if you look. One example that I really love is the movie The Neverending Story. It only has a runtime of 94 minutes, but through the lens of breaking the fifth wall, the name of the movie is actually eerily accurate. It's about a boy named Bastion who finds a book called The Neverending Story. In the book, a hero named Atreyu is on a quest to save his world from literal oblivion by finding someone called the Childlike Empress. By the time he finally does reach her, it seems as if all hope is lost. The world has dwindled almost to nothing. Atreyu has come empty-handed, with no ability to change anything. But by going on his quest, he did bring something to her. Bastion. The boy reading the book. Bastion reads his own name in disbelief as the childlike empress explains how his imagination will save their reality. And here's where they really break the fifth wall. She says to Atreyu, Just as he is sharing all your adventures, others are sharing his. She is, of course, talking about us, the movie's audience. The implication is that everyone is a part of the never-ending story. As Bastion reads Atreyu's story, we watch Bastion's. And the deeper implication is that someone is out there watching ours. And someone is watching theirs. And on and on, in an infinite, never-ending nesting doll of possible stages and audiences. You get a sense of zooming out until your story is a tiny speck of something much larger. The boundary of your cozy theater is gone. The fifth wall is, even if just for a moment, broken. That's one example of what this might look like. Another example, which uh, might surprise you coming from me, is Minecraft. At the end of the game's story, after you defeat the Ender Dragon and officially complete the game, as far as you can even be at a game like Minecraft, a long poem scrolls like credits up along the screen. It's a conversation between two higher beings that seem to have been watching your journey from another dimension as you played the game. I see the player you mean, says one of the voices. It is reading our thoughts as though they were words on a screen. It's a long conversation during which the two voices discuss your accomplishments over the course of the game. How you had imagined yourself experiencing firsthand a world full of sunlight and trees and fire and water in Minecraft. But they also call it a dream. A dream in which the world is flat and infinite and where death was temporary and the sun was a square of white in the sky. One of many dreams. Sometimes, one of the voices says, the player thought itself human on the thin crust of a spinning globe of molten rock. Sometimes it dreamed it watched words on the screen. When the game is over, the voices say that now it is time for you to wake up and begin a new dream, to dream again and better. The poem finally ends with the words, you are the player, wake up. For a game about squares, it's honestly a very touching and, dare I say, profound piece of writing. First, it breaks the fourth wall by addressing the actual player, then breaks the fifth by saying that there's more beyond that experience. Whether you take this as a literal suggestion about metaphysics or as more of a psychological commentary on the different experiences and perceptions of reality that exist within each person, 
the effect is unmistakably special. You feel it as you read this, even if it's a little difficult to process. I think that's because, on a basic human level, this is actually a real part of your life. Sure, you could someday find out that you're just part of a game or a movie or a simulation, but you don't need any of those scenarios to break the fifth wall because reality as you experience it is already, truly, as artificial as any piece of fiction. People live by political narratives, scientific simplifications of phenomena that most will never truly understand, sensory projections of a reality you can't even grasp. I mean, the world outside your senses doesn't have color or sound or perspective as you perceive it. Those are all things from an unseen, unknown world that your brain is only interpreting. From a certain point of view, it's hard to say whether any objective version of reality even exists. Humans essentially spend their entire lives exploring the world from the inside of their own brains. How much of it is truly accurate? Who can say? The fifth wall is the barrier in your mind that protects you from these thoughts. It keeps out the enormity of the idea, which everyone is one small reminder away from remembering, that you are living a dubious reality. When the fiction you're reading has the audacity to remind you of the fiction by which you live your own life, I suppose, in that case, you become the character in the play, breaking the fourth wall of your own story. You know, if you are a writer or creative of any kind, it's really easy to find yourself trapped in a similar box. It's definitely been true for me. And what I've been finding is that the more I venture outside the realm of fiction and fantasy, the more I learn about maths and sciences, the more creative I am able to be. There's a whole world out there that it's easy to see as inaccessible when you're in the arts. But it doesn't have to be. Our sponsor, Brilliant.org, can make all of that easier and more fun than it's ever been before. Brilliant really has been helping me broaden my horizons. I can always go to the site, click into a class, pick up where I left off, and take in a bite-sized piece of the fundamentals I've been missing. Whether it's maths, science, physics, anything and everything STEM, Brilliant has something for you. Lately for me, it was Brilliant's Thinking in Code class which I feel is oddly appropriate for me. I can really feel it just opening up a whole new world to me that I had almost no idea was there before. Slowly but surely, as I educate myself in this way, the AI revolution isn't looking quite so intimidating anymore. And to be perfectly honest, it doesn't even really feel like studying. A lot of what you do on Brilliant might be better classified as mini games. Look how interactive and fun these are. This one even has robots. Because Brilliant is so simple, moves at your pace, and starts at the very fundamentals, this is actually something that's really sticking for me. Almost like a personal tutor or coach. A legitimate, accessible, affordable, easy education, even for someone like me, with my head in the clouds and my face ever buried in fiction. And the best part? You can start for free. Visit Brilliant.org slash TailFoundry or click the link in the description to get your first 30 days for free. The first 200 TailFoundry fans to sign up for a yearly subscription to Brilliant will get 20% off, so definitely hurry. Those slots are going to fill up fast. Again, visit Brilliant.org slash TailFoundry to get your first 30 days for free and 20% off a year subscription. Don't let something as simple as a lack of education hold you back. Try this out for free and be as brilliant as I know that you can be. I hope this topic didn't make anyone watching feel too existential. It's an interesting one, but once that fifth wall is broken, it can be pretty hard to bounce back from. I mean, even I myself sometimes get this weird, nagging feeling that I'm just a character in a show of some kind. But of course, that would be a little ridiculous. Let's not dwell on it. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next time. Bye!